All right, thanks for joining me today on the RC Founders Club VIP webinar. Very happy to be here in Las Vegas at the Team Archon House. And today I have several questions from VIP members of the RC Founders Club that I want to answer today and share with you guys. So you guys have some really cool insights in terms of like what RC Founders Clubs are looking for, what the members are looking for of the RC Founders Club. Uh, share with some of the ideas. It's kind of a cool mastermind in the community. And I've been reading all the comments and it's really cool to see everyone engage. I got a bunch of questions right here. And um, this last uh, couple of days, I was able to hang out with some of the RC Mastermind members, RC Founders Club members. <clears throat> I would start off into questions. So the first question is from a, a member that said, um, I want to know how you apply the Mr. Game Theory book in your life. So for those of you who are not familiar with the, the Game Theory book or Mr. Game Theory's book, Mr. Game Theory is one of my strategy mentors. He's somebody who has helped me a lot in my personal and business life in terms of visualizing different strategies and options and coming very quickly with optimal solutions. However, other than that, he's also a master video game player. Mr. Game Theory is famous for being um, one of the inspirations for a very famous video game team, organizes video game tournaments, and has won as champion multiple times in a row. The, the video game Civilization became the champion of visual, uh, Civilization 4 and 5, which are very strategic games, kind of like chess, but as a video game where you try to conquer territory. Uh, he's also a very successful business person, and he works at a very, very large investment bank. Well, he has this book theory that's about life balance, and his theory is basically the premise of the theory is that he believes that life is fair. He believes that if people that are experiencing a lot of pain in their life, eventually before you die, there will be some amount of happiness that equal out that pain. And what he did is he interviewed tens of thousands of professors. Most of his clients are professors as well in the financial industry. But anyway, he was interviewing tens of thousands of professors about this theory and trying to analyze statistics and about measuring people's happiness. And he came up with this uh, theory that's just a theory. It's not necessarily proven yet. But his hypothesis is that life is fair. And what I like about this theory and the reason why I shared this theory and I shared the book also in the membership site so people who don't have it, they can get access to it, is that I think that a lot of people will suffer from really difficult times, whether it's in their business life or their dating life or personal life, just times where you have a mass amount of pain. You don't really have that hope. It's hard to get that motivation, hard to get that passion because you don't know when you're going to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I like this theory because it kind of gives a perspective of somebody who has gone through amount, a large amount of pain and suffering and to realize that you know a lot of people who suffer and they feel a lot of pain, that hard work or that ability to endure is going to pay off eventually. And I really like that concept because most of my life I've had to work very, very hard. I have a really hard work ethic in terms of my business life and my personal life. And even in terms of dating and pickup, I was just so focused on putting in the hours, the constant rejection, and overcoming fears. And you do that under the belief that things are going to work out at the end. And I really liked the idea that there is some kind of proven science behind things. So I'm a very science-based person. I'm not really into a lot of philosophy as much as, say, Tyler. So in, in this theory, a lot, some of the people will say, well, what if you have like uh, overabundance of happiness? Does that mean you're going to have an overabundance of sadness to equal things out? Well, under his theory, it's not necessarily that you're going to get an overabundance of that. It's just uh, He believes that somehow it's going to over even out, you know, where you're going to feel some um, traumatic uh, moments or what have you. Uh, now, I guess I don't want to uh, say you should not overindulge or you should, you know, try to seek out more pain because you're overly too happy and you want to be like that Buddhist monk who was just meditating all the time to feel happy. It's really just a theory. So I would just take it for that, but just use it because if it is true, then it does provide hope that even if you are feeling pain, just know that things will equal out and that there is that possibility. I guess in terms of a mindset, just having a success mindset where your mindset is focused on a positive outcome is overall going to lead you in the right direction because his belief system is about emotions and that emotional feeling that you feel, whether you're feeling those sad feelings or happy feelings and how they equal out. But you could always have a positive mindset throughout everything that you're doing. So in general, I would say don't overindulge because there's so many things that you can accomplish when you're actually putting in work. And work isn't always fun. You know, even the most fun job, like being the CEO of Real Social Dynamics, I would always say that the CEO of Real Social Dynamics job is 
both the best job and the worst job that I've ever had because it has a lot of hard work, a lot of effort. At the same time, it's very rewarding because I get to give a lot of value to students. We get to spread our message around the world. I got to myself, you know, experience a lot of really interesting facets of life by meeting a lot of really cool people, traveling around the world and learning about all sorts of new experiences. So for me, that's been a really great experience. Let's go into another question. This is from a guy named Adam. And Adam says, Thanks for taking the time to put this RZ Founders Club together. It's wonderful to see you guys moving in the right direction and I look forward to tuning in as things develop. I had a few suggestions for a couple of questions for the upcoming webinar. Over the years, what has been a couple of the biggest growth hacks that you discovered that enabled you to expand your reach and user base and website traffic? Well, the biggest thing that we're doing now is YouTube, obviously. That's where we are now. However, when we first started off in growing our business, it was based upon email going to the discussion boards that were really popular and that no longer exist and just contacting them and getting them on the phone and then inviting them out. And when we invited them out, we'd exchange email addresses and then we'd add them to an email list. But most of it was face-to-face -face lunches. Now with the power of social media, you have way more power to grow all sorts of aspects of your list. So I mean, when in the past, you might say you have an email list. Maybe that email list is like a million people. Well, that's cool, but at the same time, you could also reach a lot more people from other means because less and less people are reading email as their main means of communication and might even be over spammed. I personally don't even read my own email. I have an assistant who will go through my email and just text me when there's something important that shows up because I get way too many messages. On the other hand, we have about, I don't know, two, three hundred Facebook groups, and each of those Facebook groups will have several hundred, if not several thousand people. So that reach is even larger. So, in terms of web traffic, I think that's great. At the same time, just getting your business in front of people and getting yourself in front of people is, is a really powerful concept. And a lot of it is done face to face. That's why we do so many live programs. We do over a thousand live programs every year. And we also do webinars like you see right here, which is great because I can reach and talk to all sorts of people that are not here in person. I think that's really awesome. The next question he said is, what have been a couple of your biggest flops? Was there anything that you tried like crazy to make work but wound up throwing in the towel and making defeat. Absolutely. One of them was something called RC Underground. Now it still exists because what we tried to do was create a YouTube for just pickup videos of RC instructors. That's now called the YouTube channels of RC instructors. But back then we created this before YouTube was really, you know, this giant entity owned by Google and sharing all sorts of information. It's kind of like how we tried to recreate a social media platform and now there's Facebook. You know, we still have it, it's called RSD Nation. But we invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in these two resources combined to try to get our message out there to people and it is now uh, still great resources. We still have them, they both exist. In fact, if you go to RSD Nation, it's linked to RSD Underground, but it's really just linked to some of our YouTube channels. Now, if you really wanna stay in touch with us, the best way is to use our YouTube channels and also go to our live events post in RC Nation, post comments, and you'll be surprised because we read all of our comments and we actually try to get great engagement. The cool thing about RSD is that we have a really strong movement. If you look at, say, askmen.com, they have millions of subscribers, but they'll have less than 3,000 views and maybe you know, 10 or a dozen comments. But if you look at us, we'll have way less than Ask Men in terms of their web traffic, which is like, I don't know, 20, 30 million people on their site every month. But at the same time, if you look at our comments, our engagement, the people that are interacting with it, it's 10 times, if not 100 times or 1,000 times higher than what they're doing. Maybe like not 1,000 times, but like 100 times higher than what they're doing in terms of engagement with our students. We go face to face, we meet people. They want originally to have us actually run their seminar division and run the technology division for their company with Rupert Murdoch. And eventually we decide just to part ways and not do that deal. But it was something we were seriously considering. Instead, now we have you know, RSD. And RSD Nation, I believe, is going to be more powerful than a lot of these mainstream platforms that you see out there, including them, and a lot of the other platforms. Because even if you look at like the last two years, how you get in front of people and, you know, convey who you are, whether it's your personal brand and you're trying to network within your soul circle or your business brand, a lot of it's changed a lot just towards that social media. And I believe it's going to go even more so where anyone, no matter who you are, can reach just as many people. And it's just going to be up to you to establish your credibility, just like how Organizations like CNN have established credibility. It's going to be up to us as just individuals or organizations like RSD to establish credibility, just display our message in a very strong and powerful way that's entertaining and insightful. Because 
we're two parts of a business. We're both an entertainment company and the other one is an education company. We combine them together and we have great infotainment because we always captivate the mind, we captivate the soul and your emotions. We're able to get you interested in our message and you'll learn a lot more when you're interested. So let's go to this next question. What recommendations would you give to entrepreneurs that are new to creating a YouTube channel? Are there any tricks that help you get traction in your early days, any pitfalls that should be avoided? Well, the biggest thing is that you should post on a regular schedule. So I use a lot of resources to find out what that schedule is. That's why my channel is very young. It has a lot of traction. I use sources like Federator and I look at what days are the most, most popular posting days. And I eventually chose to post two shows, a show on Monday and a show on Thursday. Eventually I might do every day of the week like I used to do. But I want to have each day kind of like its own show. I also look at a, a lot of other YouTubers. So I look at guys like Casey Neistat who posts every day has millions of people. I look at people that are posting really interesting music videos. I might even create a music video in the future. In fact, I'm already working on one. And I think that's really cool to have really fun, entertaining things. Things that will surprise. I mean, we did some 360 videos of my home where you could actually take your mobile phone, move it around, and you could actually see everything that I see. You can see my old childhood home. You can see me at Comic-Con. And it's just really cool, fun, new ways of explaining yourself with new visual effects. And virtual reality, I think, is going to be a new way we show infield videos, whether it's for both business and for the boot camps we see in our ding and all sorts of videos. Now, um, in terms of other kinds of traction, regularity is really important. So you got to post at least once a week. If you look at real social dynamics instructors, always at least once a week. Sometimes they'll even do it two times in the day or two or three times a week. But it's really, if, if you, there's like a special thing that comes up. You want to post in that day. If there's like, say, um, a product launch, for example, tomorrow we were launching an awesome product with RSD Max. Check out the RSD Max channel and you'll get all sorts of information about it. It's called The Natural. Now, you'll notice that Max has been posting pretty much every day. And he's also been streaming like every day continually over the last few months, just sharing information, sharing ideas. It's just about getting the time because also Max has been traveling on Hawaii and California and all over Europe. And, you, you know, I guess me as a, owner of Real Social Dynamics and running the business operations, it's been a real challenge to try to put in the time to make all these videos. Now, I've done that because I really have a strong enjoyment of it. It's fun. It's inspiring. And it kind of gets you out of the routine of just doing the business, typing on your computer, making phone calls. Now, I have a treadmill desk, so I can at least like walk at the same time. But I love the creativity involved and the inspiration that comes from doing these innovative things. So make whatever you're doing fun create awesome content. And by content, I mean actual insights because that's basically how almost everyone defines content. If they could actually implement that in your life as opposed to just theories. But I think theories also can be considered content, but actual insights is what I consider the true content of what's out there. All right, so as you mentioned that back in the day when you guys had a physical office, you used to yell a lot. What techniques and practices can you use in order to deal with the stress, anxiety, and fear, which could sometimes manifest itself as anger while pushing yourself to the absolute limit? So you might be referring to what I was talking in the RSC Founders Club about how I was really angry and frustrated a lot of my time when I was first building my company. Back in 2004, yeah, although we were living in a $6 million mansion in the Hollywood Hills, in fact, I think it was on sale for $47 million recently because it got remodernized, but no one's going to buy that. So they dropped the price to like $17 million. But it was an awesome, epic house. And it was so much fun. There was like parties and stuff like that for everyone but me. I was in an office making phone calls, working so hard that if I wanted to take some time off, and I did take time off now and then, but most of the time I would be working so hard that instead of me just going to sleep, I wouldn't even take off my shoes, take off my clothes, put into pajamas. I would just lie down, go to sleep, and wake up and continue to working. I was so frustrated because I had so much of the burden of building teams, building the company, and building the business of Real Social Dynamics, and everyone else is picking up girls. And I was more interested and just the ladder, just going out in the field and having fun. It was like being a frog in a pond. It's your natural habitat when you're going out in the field every day, especially when you're doing it three years in a row. So yeah, I'm still going out. But during the daytime, it was really frustrating to try to like moderate my mind, thinking, man, I really want to go out, but I'm focused so much on this business. Nowadays, I really enjoy the business, but I had to build systems and processes to get over that. I also listened to a lot of uh, really interesting theories from people that helped me moderate that. For example, Tyler told me that he just decided not to get angry when things go really bad. I said, really? That's interesting. What do you mean? He goes, well, I just decided that when things get really tough, there's no point in getting angry. It's not like it's going to help me. I said, yeah, logically, that makes sense. Now, a lot of people just can't will the removal of anger. It gets difficult. But at the same time, there's an author named Stephen Covey who wrote my favorite book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He said, you can control your emotions. There's ways to do it. 
And I've been thinking about that a lot. And a lot of the time, as I will just logic myself into like getting into the right moment. But a lot of people can't do that. They'll get into meditation. I'll do things to also get over those times that are really difficult, like going, just going out, just trying new things, maybe traveling or going to a golf club. Playing golf actually came just because during Joy Gate, there was so much pressure and stress. I needed to find an out to relieve that. I wanted to do something that was outdoors, but it didn't put a lot of pressure on my knees because I got injured doing marathons and races, long distance races like Ironman. So I started picking up golf. But I think that whether you're doing like a meditation or if you're doing like some kind of spiritual thing, I'm really not spiritual at all. So I basically am just looking for more things, things that help me. And I guess the things that help me is just doing things that are different, getting my mind on new things or things that are inspiring or creative. So I get excited and I have a lot of fun when I'm doing things that are involving like creativeness as opposed to just doing the same thing again and again, building systems and just maintaining the system. So I love the idea of building a new business line for real social dynamics, especially in the concepts of using business, using sales, and going in field to do it. So I created this channel to try to like show to the world that I have a lot of experience. I have this mastermind group, user inspiration to educate my clients and they're the people that are really interested in business from some of the most powerful people in the world will come to my channel and they'll also get some credibility, some street credibility for myself. Because although I built RSD, I am interviewing people that own billion dollar companies. They have become famous for business. And also I'm interviewing people that are great at networking, relationships in general, because I think a lot of people don't want to become business owners. They want to get success in their business life and then use that in their relationships, have the right mindsets and what have you. But all of it combines together. Uh, you know, you can make even more money working for somebody else as a business owner, but you can also make a ton of money as a business owner as long as you take the risk and accept it. But then those frustrations come in, like the frustrations that I have to deal with on a regular basis. You just have to be ready for it. It's a risk that you take. But for me, I'm always willing to do that. I'm very risk adverse. All right. So let's see. Russell here says, how do you plan for retirement? Well, I used to do a lot of retirement plans. I actually used to work as a financial advisor. I did that for Transamerica. I also used to work for several financial institutions, Payne Weber UBS. Uh, I worked with Payne Weber in San Francisco as well in their corporate office. And the thing about retirement is you have to look at what is retirement to you. Like, is it like an aggressive thing where you're just, you want to invest in stocks? If you, do you want to do like a hedge fund? Do you want to see something more conservative? Investing your money in cash and in like low interest rate or long-term government bonds or, you know, IRAs. Those are very popular. I used to sell those a lot. IRAs are individual retirement plans where you invest in mutual funds. Now, uh, the thing that I'm trying to do now for RSD is develop a retirement plan internally within my own company that's going to be based on savings of cash and potential investment in safe investments. Now, I think that's really safe. Now, as a business owner, I have RSD as a great retirement plan. I also have my family that's also leaving me a lot of assets as well. But people who don't have that, you definitely need to make a game plan so that you can look down the line. I remember there used to be a really popular book back in the day called The Millionaire Next Door. The concept was that if you could take just a couple thousand dollars every month for 20 years and put it into a mutual fund plan or some kind of a low interest rate plan, within that 20 years, you'll make one to $2 million. A lot of people just are like, wow, that's amazing because you're putting a lot less into that plan over that time, but it just grows over time and the compound interest grows. On the other hand, a lot of today is built upon being able to establish a business of your own or to work with people that have a really secure business and making sure that you're safe there and developing the skill set so that you will have the skills so that if one company goes out of business or you lose your job, you have the ability to jump into a new job. I never really liked the idea of just retiring and not doing anything. I think that even the people that I know in my family that are retired, they don't like just sitting around. They prefer to try to find consulting gigs on the side or other jobs or get involved with real estate or other kinds of investments. So I was always worried that if I ever retired, that would become me. At the same time, life could get really stressful and you could also just want to have a change in focus. Maybe uh, you establish yourself as a family man and you want to go towards that focus. Then, yeah, developing a regular retirement, having that savings is extremely important. But I mean, I don't like giving general advice because usually what you want to do is you want to talk to someone one-on-one, -on -one, ask them what their risk aversion is, ask them what their goals are, what their lifestyle is, and then base it upon that. And there's a ton of books out there that do that, but almost every financial planner will be doing that as well. If you move to a new city and you don't know anyone, what would be your first move to improve your non-existent social circle? Well, I just did that. I moved to Las Vegas two years ago. Now, fortunately, I had Las Vegas Immersion Program. I mean, the Vegas Immersion Program is a social circle in and of itself. 
But one of the things I started to do was look for organizations or groups of people that already had a social circle. I was lucky because I knew some people out here, so it was kind of like cheating. I had uh, Tony Shea, and he had a social circle out here, and I started hanging out at his crib and meeting people there. I also joined a country club. Now, when I was in Harvard, I would just go to events. I would go to seminars. I would try to meet people. And then I would meet some of my wife's classmates, and I'd start inviting them to parties. And I developed an uh, inner circle chapter. So if you want an instant social circle, every single city in the world, that's like a huge major city, like at least a half million people, is a part of our RC Inner Circle Facebook groups. And if you join that by going to, I think it's rcnation.com forward slash groups, or just link to rcnation.com, you could join one of our various Facebook groups and you could have that instant soul circle of like-minded guys who are in the RSD, they know what we're about, and they like going out to bars and clubs, usually active and going out and meeting girls. And they have that common mindset. So that's one way. You could also use going.com, meetup.com. They all have Facebook events all the time. I mean, I used to go to video game groups locally here in Vegas to develop my soul circle. Now, I mean, uh, this upcoming week, I'm going to a Pokemon Go pub crawl. You know, it's, it's kind of fun just to have like interesting hobbies that you like and just having like-minded people to do that. But if you want to really establish your own and be in control of the filter of who's a part of that soul circle, you got to get their phone numbers, you got to organize your own meetups, or just invite people on a regular basis to dinner parties and lunch parties. When I was in LA, I invited people out every week, almost every night to do something because I just didn't want to eat alone. I know that Keith Ferrazzi wrote a book called Never Eat Alone, and it became a really popular book about networking. And I've never read it, but I love the title because I really believe in that title. In fact, when I was first doing pickup, I would just walk up to girls at the cafeteria at my university and just walk up, start a conversation, sit down with them, and just talk about whatever was on my mind because I just didn't like the idea of eating alone and I wanted to pick her up. But the thing is, by doing this, whether it's in your business life, you just want to network with people, invite them out, or you want to do in your personal life, it's an awesome way just to grow it. I used to even call random people from the Yellow Pages. Back in the day, we had Yellow Pages as opposed to Google. So as a result, I would call people from the Yellow Pages, like an inventor or a corporate attorney, and I'd say, hey, I want to learn more about what you do. Or I'd call an uh, investment banker at Goldman Sachs and say, hey, I just read a book called Den of Thieves about the scandal, which was the inspiration for the movie Wall Street. And I'd love to talk to you about your role as an investment banker. And I just invite people out. I invite famous musicians out to meet with me in New York. And they invite me to like family dinner parties. You never know. People just... If you just ask, people will say yes. You never know when. So never be afraid of asking. And I usually also always try to say yes as much as I can when I have time. Even though I don't have time, I'll try to clear my schedule and make time. If it's someone who I want to meet, if someone who I think has something interesting to contribute. All right, let's see what else we got here. So if you have a high quality girlfriend or friend, but you think you can find higher quality, do you end a relationship immediately or do you keep it going until you actually do find higher quality? All right, well, I have a lot of friends. I don't like burning bridges. I might not hang out with friends, you know, that are, you know, just people that are not as fun as other people or just not as, as much value to my life as other people, but I don't really cut them out unless they're a leech. So if they're a negative leech or an energy leech on me, yeah, I definitely want to cut those people out of my life completely. And I just will end that as much as I can, as fast as I can. If you're in a situation where you don't have a lot of options, then you got to get used to the thing as I was just telling you about by building your soul circle so you would have that. In terms of dating, on the other hand, if you're in that dating phrase and you're really looking at dating a lot of people, then just date a lot of people. However, when you clarify your relationship, just make sure the other party knows what your expectations are or you're going to have some mistrust violations and that relationship is going to be destroyed or it's going to be hurt very, very badly. Just make sure that whatever you're doing, your expectations are clear. It works very, very appropriately in the business world. The biggest thing I've learned from communications and from taking classes on communication is that you've got to clarify your expectations of what you want in your relationship with the other people that you're engaged with. And if you don't, you get what's called social violations, which is a mixed match, mismatch of expectations. And then it results to a lot more headache than you want to deal with. Now, if you do have a situation where you do have a lot of that headache, there's courses on that. There's a course that Tyler had, everyone in my company studied among our executive team called Crucial Conversations, which are those conversations that are high emotions, high risk, and conflicting opinions, in which case you want to meet in person and talk it out. And the resolving of these conflicts definitely is, never should be done by email or text message. It should be done either in person or Skype or at least by phone so you have a voice. Because miscommunications and messages is a huge thing that happens all the time. Communications is the most important thing out there. And as a result of it being so important, I believe that the teaching of relationships 
and the sharing of how relationships communicate and work well together and fit together like a puzzle, that's going to be the most valuable skill that people could have. And that's why we teach it because there's very few people that teach it well. And we do it here in RSD extremely well. All right, so the next questions are coming from Richie. He's another member of the Founders Club. He says, so many instructors have built big brands on YouTube. It seems whether or not a new instructor gets YouTube traffic is ultimately a big factor that determines whether they get to launch products amid the success of those products. There's a strong correlation between the popularity of the instructors on YouTube and the popularity of the instructor. My question is how they do it. What is the best step-by-step -step approach that instructors build a YouTube channel from scratch? Well, for us, we have a cool like, cross-emotional function where RSD is a team as opposed to just being Tyler because we believe as a team, you could permeate the mainstream and grow stronger and reach more people and have a more powerful message than if you're just a solo person. So you see a lot of videos where we cross-emote. You'll see me doing a lot of videos with other YouTube celebrities that we cross-emote each other, we build each other's brand. That helps a lot. It also just develops a lot of cred uh, credibility. But you gotta know what you're talking about. You gotta definitely have a lot of content. Now we travel around the world and make things interesting. Cool new backdrops, cool new stories. We do a lot of live events. And the biggest way that we build our content is from teaching. So we teach boot camps every single weekend. And most of our content comes from the field because you learn from the girls you meet, you learn from the guys you meet, you learn from the students' lessons. And all the different stories combined together makes it to the point where if you look at even some of the largest and most powerful organizations on the planet, whether it's like Tony Robbins, or whether it's a lot of gurus out there that you see out there, they don't have as much content in terms of the amount of content they teach in terms of um, YouTube videos as we do, because we could release content literally every day among our you know, 15 to 25 channels on YouTube, because our guys are continually out in the field and teaching way more than everyone else. I taught a keynote speech and it's actually on my YouTube channel. I think the title of the video is called Memorable Milestones of Real Social Dynamics. I was a keynote speaker at the World Speaker Summit and we were the company that taught more hours than any other company that was there. And there was a lot of gurus, a lot of famous people out there because we teach so many of these small one-on-one -on -one events and large events and a lot of it is really just to develop the content so we could share it with you guys in the larger events and digital products and all sorts of videos on YouTube and also because it's more fun that way. But we also are able to develop a better message. And if you look at our content, our content, and especially in like our paid products is amazing, but even our free content on our YouTube channels is better than almost everyone else's paid content. So as a result of having excellent content, I think that is the key, the quality is key. And if you keep things interesting and fun, I mean, I know some people that make YouTube channels just playing video games all day, they make tons of money. In fact. The guys at Archon House, they'll share some strategies, but they're entertaining people. And these guys make millions of dollars here. Now they have a cool house. It's kind of like Project Hollywood Mansion, but just for video games. And it's a very, very similar model of what we do. Well, let's get going. So we got a, a series of four categories of questions that I'd like to answer here. This is from more, uh, more of RC Founders Club members. I'm going to go a little bit quicker through some of these questions. The first one's about affiliates. So for those of you guys who are not in the business, affiliates are people that market your service if you're a business owner. Would you recommend giving out different affiliate percentages based on this size or raw numbers of sales? Or do you keep the percentages across the board? For example, someone with a list of 15,000 people, they get 20% commissions. But someone with 200,000 gets 50%. For real social dynamics, we don't really do it like that. Um, usually if people are selling our stuff, it's 50-50 across the board. Now, uh, you can make any custom kind of commission that you want. If you have a good hookup, then, then mix it up. I prefer just doing it that way because it's fair among everyone. It says, do you use super affiliates? So super affiliates are those guys who have massive lists and they market to their list. And um, yeah, we definitely use super affiliates. We do have a lot of people that market to us, to their entire list, and that's one of the hugest things that got us traffic. Someone earlier asked, how do you get a lot of traffic? Well, Super Affiliates is a huge way to go. There's a guy named Evan Pagan that used to market as hardcore. He created uh, 10 or 12 products, and we were on like 80 or 90% of them, just marketing and creating content that he'd sell. Now, what's interesting is about that is that he would sell the product at 100% of the money, but he would just say, hey, these guys are the best in the world. Check out their stuff. And it's true. We were the best in the world. We still are. And now we um, were able to use his list to build RSD. And now we have a lot of other guys for Super Affiliates as well. Do affiliates sign up like other affiliates for a second tier commission or a small amount, like an MLM structure? 
Well, that's interesting. Some people used to do that. So we used to have uh, affiliate programs and then people below them would sell and they would get a cut. Now, any of our affiliates could work out whatever deal they want. We offer a one-tier affiliate structure as opposed to a two-tier, like you see a lot of insurance companies do, where they have people who are hired, they get an affiliate and they give some of their cuts to the people below them, et cetera, and you have a pyramid going to the top. But I believe that, um, yeah, that's useful. I mean, I know in their sales team, for example, people will share commissions if they have the same client and they, that client is talking to multiple people at the same time. So yeah, I mean, I guess in that sense, we kind of do it, but it's not necessarily two tiers. It's kind of like one tier, but shared in that sense. But I think that, yeah, it could work. Um, we're not necessarily doing that, but if any of our affiliates are watching this and they want to do that, that's totally fine with me. So for advertising, how should I get started with pay-per-click ads? Well, RSD we used to use a lot of Google AdWords. And then for some reason, there was all sorts of weird restrictions on dating companies, and so no, we're no longer using AdWords. They want us to have weird disclaimers as if we were like a drug company or a smoking service where it says, this advice may or may not get the same results. Every person may get different results. Then please know that... Um, you know, the results may vary, that kind of stuff. And it's like these long disclaimers. And we we're like, you know, that'd be like really, really weird if we put that kind of stuff on every website that we're advertising on. People do that in the financial industry, and we thought that was kind of weird. So we actually don't spend a lot of money on advertising. We don't spend a lot of money on pay-per-click ads, but we do do that on Facebook. Facebook has been great for us. We use a lot of retargeting services where people go to our website, and then people who are already interested in our product, we remind them of cool new things. Like, well, we, we continue new banners every month where we'll market the new product, the new cool ideas that we have, and you'll see them on Facebook all the time. You might even see them through other retargeting services. So if we say that you're buying a Toyota, you're buying a BMW, you might see our banners and our ads there because you were on our website previously. So we do stuff like that. So it says, should I hire out pay-per-click ads or read up on it and do it internally? I used to spend almost 100000 a month on pay-per-click ads. I know guys like Ty Lopez who've spent tons of money on doing that. I don't do that anymore. I learned how to do it internally though. I mean, I read a ton of stuff about this by studying a ton of gurus. My mentor is a guy named Corey Rudel, created a company called internetmarketing.com. It doesn't really exist anymore, the website URL does, but Corey's dead, he died in a race car accident. But a lot of his mentors, a lot of his mastermind members create all sorts of products and Google AdWords, like John Reese, a good friend of mine, and he created a product on AdWords and a bunch of other people create similar products in AdWords. And I went through even Google's official AdWords program and even taught my marketing team to go through that as well. And Studying AdWords is great if you want to create this kind of stuff and also allows you to understand what your clients are searching for, understanding your customer if you're a business owner is really important. The same way understanding you know, who you're dating is really important, being able to calibrate. What about Facebook ads? Well, I just talked about that, but I mean, another thing I could talk, also mention is that one of the things you could do about Facebook is you could do what we do, which is upload our entire email list to Facebook when you do custom advertisements. And that allows us to reach those people who you know, may not have added themselves on our fan page. But if you're watching this, Join our fan page. Right now, today, there's about 44,000 subscribers and fans, and we're gonna add a lot more video and a lot more content to that and other sorts of sources of video and other cool competitions and join all of our social media. I'd love to show you all the cool new things we're doing and just by checking them out, I think you'll learn a lot as well. All right, what is retargeting ads and how do I use them? To break down what a retargeting ad is, is there's a file that's downloaded your, on your computer when you visit our website. It's an invisible file. It's not like a big thing. All it does is say you went to our website and it sends a little ping or a signal to a retargeting company. A retargeting company is a company that will notice that signal and be a part of a network that says, okay, this customer likes this company because they went to their website. And as a result, we will show their ads and their banners all over the world. This stuff isn't cheap at all, but if you go to Facebook and there's services that are really cheap for this kind of thing, then yeah, I mean, there's a ton of retargeting services that do this and I think they're awesome. Production and content. So what cameras do you use for production of your events and what about the field? So we use uh, really expensive cameras. I don't recommend everyone doing what we do because we spent over a million dollars in camera gear. And unless you have the scale to justify what we do, definitely not do it because we're, we're invested in all sorts of cinema cameras from the top of the line cinema cameras from Canon, the C100 all the way up. We've, we have guys on our team who experimented with the Epic, the RED cameras, those really fancy cameras that create Star Wars. A lot of our guys like the Sony A7S or even the Mark III's or the Mark II's, but the Mark III's are great for DSLRs, for photos, for thumbnails. Um, but yeah, we'll take everything from Ricoh's, 
which are 360 cameras, to higher versions of that. The drone cameras have 4K controls, like the Inspire 1, to um, all sorts of cameras. I mean, all, each team will use its own. Some of them will go in the field with A7S or Black Magic cameras. We use Shoguns, we'll use a lot of 4K work because we're trying to get the highest quality resolution and our lenses will cost you so much for our cameras. So if you have like a 5,000, 10,000 dollar camera, we might have a 5,000, 10,000 dollar lens. When we first started, we used regular, regular hand cams. I see a lot of guys on YouTube, they're just using phone cameras. That's totally cool with them. But we're trying to be a different kind of company. We're trying to add that cinematic appeal, that kind of feature film kind of appeal. If you even look at like my one minute trailer to my YouTube channel itself, it's kind of like a feature film intro. We have tons of camera guys that are working with our guys and literally travel around the world like Motley Crue, just like having an entourage of cameramen that follow them around and, and film. We have, I mean, our, our tripods are several thousand dollars. We have everything from um, steady cams to like Ronin steady cams, which are these super expensive ones that require two men, one person to control it, one person to control the camera angle. And we have multiple person drones where you could, one person flies the drone and one person controls the camera. But uh, yeah, we, we use all sorts of really awesome gear. So if you look at our stuff, you'll see a lot of that cinematic effect and we're upgrading all the time. I literally am spending thousands of dollars every week, all year long on upgrading to the newest hot stuff. Tyler is like an executive producer for movies. He's always trying to find the newest thing. If you go to our mansion in Hollywood Hills, we have a production center, center that's kind of like CNN with a full like $200,000 production stage. We have blue screen, green screen in my house in Vegas. I have green screen backdrops. I have like five safes with like a half a million dollars of gear in it. We have all sorts of stuff trying around with our instructors, but we love the idea of film. I mean, I can tell why. I mean, my wife, she went to Harvard to study digital media. And as a result of her having this interest in film, I was like, well, let me get you some cool gear. And I saw what she did and she was really talented. And I said, you know what? This would look really awesome for RC videos. I mean, just upgraded and again and again and again. And so does she. Now she has a video production company, has awesome gear, and so do we. I consider ourselves somewhat of a video production company as well, just that our only clients are RSD. Okay, so it says, what about Snapchat? It still baffles me how to use it in business. Now, if you look at Tyler, Tyler is snapping all the time. I remember seeing the most epic Snapchat I've ever seen. It was a story where Tyler's like, hey man, I'm in, a, or hey, hey everyone, I'm f flying to uh, New York. He's at the LAX airport. Cool, I just landed in New York. Hey guys, I'm about to check in my hotel. Cool, I'm about to walk to the RC free tour seminar, speak in front of 500 people. Then you have Tyler speaking in front of 500 people and picking up girls. He's like, it was an awesome event, now I'm about to go to a bar. Cool, there's a hot girl over there, let me approach her. Then you have a video of him walking out of the bar with the girl. He says, you know what, I wanna hook up with this girl in the alley over here. And he says it right in front of the girl and the girl laughs. Then he hooks up with the girl in the alley. Then he talks about how his night went at the end of the night over food with R.C. Madison. And he created this story. I thought it was so impressive that he did this all real time on Snapchat in these like 30 second to one minute videos that I actually took a second camera and filmed the camera so I could capture it. Because I know that you could download your own Snapchats and re-upload them to YouTube. And that's another way you could market your Snapchats. But I think it's kind of like an upgraded version of Twitter. So when I was on tour, I did a 270 tour, 270 city tour in 70 countries. And I was using this thing, it was called um, Ning or something like that. It was, just a, it was, a, there was a text message service where I texted it to, I texted a message and went to Twitter, Facebook, all the different services and social media all at the same time. And Twitter is cool because you have text and you can link to other sites and what have you. But as millennials get more and more bored with having to go from site to site to site and use different services, they just want all in one. The cool thing about Snapchat, it has like YouTube aspects, Instagram aspects, and Twitter aspects all in one source. In the future, it's like what Gary Vaynerchuk always says. He says, people are going to get lazy. You don't even want to go to a website. You want to be able to buy from the YouTube video itself. Click buy. And I think that we're going to be releasing videos where you can actually do that in the future. And I think uh, RC instructors are already preparing that as well. All right, so it says, how do you organize your content publishing schedule? Do you track it and keep everyone focused with content production? What's your workflow process? Yes, we absolutely do. We have a marketing calendar that's spread among all of our marketing team and all of our instructors. And we use it to market when we're gonna email, we're gonna send out content. Also, each day of the week, a different instructor has control of our destination posts. And also each day of the week, they can put posts on their own YouTube channel. They can do as much as they want. And we'll send out emails and market all their different videos and promote all their different things. And then in terms of like the production schedule for videos or products, yeah, we have teams of people and we'll put budget towards these people to create epic products. It'll cost a ton of money up front and then we expect to make 10 times more than we put in back in the back end after we launch that product. And it might take six months, it might take a year, it might take longer. But we take that risk because I believe so much in the people here. When people who are VCs, they look at investing in a company, 
They look at the idea, but more importantly than that is the people that you're investing in. Because if they're smart, the idea is kind of secondary because they'll figure out a way to make money. They're most likely not going to lose if they're winners. You just have to make sure that they're not people who are just going to spend, spend, spend and try to build a company just to sell. I like companies that are kind of able to bootstrap and grow. If you look at guys like John Paul DeJoya, he never like had to raise a bunch of money to build his company. He might have some investors now, I'm not sure, but I know that most of his life, he built a company that was based on financing itself internally from the profits within. That's exactly what we did with Real Social Dynamics. No investors, no outside influence, complete control of our brand message so we can maintain the quality of both our business systems and the content without any outside influence trying to push for profits. All right, do you require a quota from your creators around content? A video per day, per week, how does this work, who tracks it? We have a chief marketing officer named Mikhail who tracks this stuff and people are not on the ball, Tyler's gonna hear about it. And when Tyler hears about it, he's gonna get on you and he's gonna make things happen. But we wanna have everyone post videos at least once a week. If it doesn't happen, maybe they have things going in their life they're doing with, I, I hear about them. We'll give them some slack. But ideally you wanna have that regularity because if you don't, you kind of go out of touch. Now, sometimes we'll mix it up. So instead of just having a regular video every week on one particular channel, you're gonna put it on other channels. But on the RC channels, you'll always see videos almost every day of the week on at least one of our channels. Now, if you go to, say, my featured channels or the channels that my channel subscribed to, you can see all the RSD channels. I think there's like 15 of them that I'm presently subscribed to. And I think it's awesome to kind of see all the content we put out. And you could learn a little bit more about how we do things in a very like realistic way. So if you want to actually see it as opposed to just me talking about it, that's what you should do. Can you list some of the camera equipment you use for field work and studio shots? So one of the things if you don't have expensive video equipment and you have a following on is that you can get other people's studios or borrow their equipment. You also rent equipment, experiment with what you can. Schools, universities, what have you, used to be the way we used to do things. We used to experiment with every kind of possible rental just to see how good it was. So if we want to say, consider getting a C300, C500 cinema camera, We'll like rent it first and make sure that it works good before we buy one. If we don't think it's like, if we think it's overkill, we might get a C100. So we'll just like vary it up. But we'll try all sorts of gear, every kind of equipment, and we'll use it for different shots. We have tons of lighting gear. We'll create our own studios because we have the resources for that. But if you don't and you have a following, people will lend it to you. Even YouTube, if you have these 10,000 subscribers, will give you free studio space and free rentals of equipment and gear. We don't use their space, but we've been invited to do so. And I personally have networked with a lot of people at the YouTube offices and have usage of their offices because we're YouTube celebrities. We have almost a million followers among our multiple YouTube channels combined together. And so we have a very good relationship with them. If you don't have that and you're trying to get your brand out there, use your phone. I know people that have hundreds of thousands of YouTube subscribers who just use their phone. That's cool. On the other hand, we're looking at eventually making documentaries and movies and our video products and content will continually get better. So we're trying to do things on a very high level. We used to spend tons of money on rentals though. Like if you look at the blueprint to code, that was like $80,000 for that weekend shot. Plus to create the DVDs, film it, post produce it, edit it. That was like $360,000, very expensive. At the same time, we hired the producers of the TV show Lost to actually record that. We went to their studios. I even had the guys from Lost as my professors at USC during my MBA program. because so I went to both film school and business school at the same time at USC. So one of the things that you could do is do that. You could hire people if you had the budget. Then you don't have to worry about using all this gear. But we learned the systems. We were like, man, we're spending so much money on this. And we're filming not just like a weekend once a year anymore. Now we're doing it every day. So we had to learn how to be our own produce, producers, how to be executive producers, how to be post producers, how to be cameramen, how to be editors. So we have all those skills. We have special effects skills, graphic skills, graphic design. You just have the right team. So we have a massive team. You look behind the scenes, we have tons of people who work for us. Hundreds of people who, people who work for us and it's, it's awesome. You know, we have volunteers, we have interns, people who allow us to afford to do all the epic things that movie studios can do but with the power of just people who love what we do and put the passion into sharing our mission, our goals, and help us achieve that by getting out the awesome content to you guys. How do you film people in public without getting sued? Well, there's two ways to do that. You could do what we've done with TV shows like YouTube, where afterwards you could get disclaimer signed, but if you also want to get into some of the technicalities, there's also a lot of places where you can film, and as long as one of the two parties 
like for example, Las Vegas, as long as one of the two parties know that they're being filmed, like I know I'm being filmed because I want to be filmed, the other party doesn't, it's still legal. You also, as long as you're not selling it for commercial purposes, you blur out the faces, that's fine. There's also some situations where you can also just get permission from the people. But the bottom line is, everything that we do, we run by attorneys. So if you're thinking about doing this, run it by attorneys. One of the fears that I have is that we're about to launch into infield business programs. So if I'm trying to close a deal with somebody as their wingman for business and the other party doesn't know about it, even if it's legal, these guys have money. They might try to sue me not knowing whether or not what I was doing was legal or not. Sometimes I've even had cameras taken away from me from bartenders and police officers and they'll go to court and I'll get my camera back. I'll prove that we're under legal rights. I've never lost camera gear. I've never lost film footage due to being confiscated by a bartender or a club owner. But I've had it taken away and I had to go to court and police stations to get it. But what we do is legal and as a result, we're able to get around that. Bottom line is I have an army of attorneys. I talk to my attorneys every day. In fact, I'm even at Harvard studying law. So as a result, it's really, really important for me to be on top of law. All right, let's talk about team members. Do you pay, do you pay your team members weekly or monthly? I pay them bi-weekly and some of them monthly. It also depends on the job because sometimes, sometimes I'll pay it by project. But it's up to you. Just talk to your team if you're working in a team and you're a manager of a team and uh, do something that works. Do you have training for your interns and how does that work to keep your company culture pure? Absolutely. We have a training program where interns will be trained for several months to get into the corporate culture and see if we like working with them before we start paying them. And it's extremely important because we are a company that has very tight margins because we put so much into growth, so much into content, more than almost any other service company. And as a result, we leverage the power of this massive network of volunteers to grow our company. So we'll train them, maybe it'd be about how to use cameras. If you look at, say, like some of my drone footage, that was from an intern that when he joined our company, he didn't know how to shoot a camera. He never had shot on camcorders, nevertheless DSLR cameras, cinema cameras, or flying drones. Now he can do all of it better than many people that work for feature film studios. So we train our guys. We do that not just for that, but for every aspect of company, finance, HRIT, et cetera. Even our instructor assistants, uh, who help instructors and they get them into the field and help with all their logistics from their travel to their marketing to sales, whatever. Everyone gets training. So if you want to get more information about this, you can go to rscemployment.com. You can apply for an internship. It's an awesome program. Okay. Can you explain more about reverse top grading process, how that works in more detail? So if you guys have watched my RC Founders Club internal videos, you'll notice that there's something that I call anti-top grading, or what he says is reverse top grading. I think it's kind of funny to call it that because there's this training program he's just in my HR department to called top grading. It's a program that's like $5,000 a day. There's this book that became famous called Top Grading. It's about how to do these massively long three-hour interviews and only hire A-level players. And you'll get A-level players and it'll be expensive. And for us, well, yeah, we'll do that for chief level guys, whether like a chief marketing officer, chief operations officer, chief strategy officer, you know, the, the kind of guys you pay big, big bucks, you know, six, seven figure salary kind of guys. But for those guys that, you know, have a lot of administrative roles, tasks we need, and we need a lot of them, like video production, video editing, sales, marketing, IT, we'll try them out. And the, the, basically the concept of anti-top rating is you give everyone a shot. Give them a small job small job might be record this video. A bigger job is record a video and then edit the video. Next job is record a video, edit the video, and then make it a multi-camera shot as opposed to a one camera shot. And you just keep giving them more and more and more. If they do a good job, you give them more. If they fail, you give them less. You just take some of those roles and responsibilities away because maybe it's not that they're incompetent. Maybe it's just the fact that they don't like that job. Maybe they want to do something else. And I like that idea because it helps the culture because when your guys are happy, they're more, they're more willing to work with you and we'll help them out, we'll teach them cool skills, and if they don't have the skills that they need for this, we'll give them a shot at something else. Now, if they're just purely not into it, they're not putting in the hard work or ethic, or they're just not the right culture fit, I, yeah, I'd prefer them to get out. Well, that was the last of the RC Founders Club uh, videos. Let me just quickly go through some of the questions here to see if there's any of the questions that are on this chat that I think that are really interesting. Okay. So 
The question is, okay, so why is this a VIP webinar? Well, this is a webinar that's for RSD Founders Club members, me answering their questions. And if you join RSD Founders Club, or if you are a member of RSD Founders Club, you get a lot of awesome content, and you got to also get the priorityness of asking questions directly to me, having me review them, and answer them. And in fact, it's also one of the ways that I could actually create the content for the RSD Founders Club and the YouTube channel here. So the Ask Nick Co Show is something I'm doing every Monday, and a lot of those questions are from members of the RSD Founders Club. All right, what else do we have here? Ah, oh, someone says singing. I want to hear you sing. It's probably because I was talking about music videos. Actually, I was talking about hip hop. So I'm more working on getting some rap going. And actually, my wife was writing some lyrics with me, and I was talking to Brandon Carter, who you saw as a health and fitness guru. But if you Google him, he actually used to be sponsored by Sony Entertainment. That was his record label, and he created a bunch of hip-hop. I also have a friend named Prince Malik. He, uh, he's a billionaire that also owns a ton of businesses, but he also has all sorts of music and his own record label. He works with like Fat Joe. Um, I think he works with Lil Wayne, a bunch of other famous people. And uh, I'm working with these guys, and we'll, we'll come up with something really cool and fun. All right. So yeah, we have um, three tiers of membership here at RSC Founders Club. If you're in one of the lower tiers, try to upgrade to the platinum tier. And in a very short period of time, I'm building this mentorship program for those people that really want to work directly with me. That'll be their chance to do so. I haven't released the details because I haven't created the details. I'm really trying to build it after I finished the RC Founders Club content. There's still a bunch of interviews with people I'm posting. I've done a lot of it and you see a lot of it if you just log into the membership site today. But I'm going to make it only available to members of the platinum membership for RC Founders Club. So if you're not, go to rcfoundersclub.com, get a membership or upgrade your membership and join. So thanks guys, it was an awesome experience to kind of do a live stream. I want to uh, thank you for showing up, being a part of this community and inter interacting with me. I had a good time, I'd love to do this again. Uh, I saw and got inspiration for doing this from RSD Max who has a ton of live streams all the time. And I think that in the future it'd be really cool. So I mean, if you look at a lot of uh, live streams, you'll probably see like a webcam. And you look at me, here, you know, I have a fancy cinema camera production crew. I'm in a studio. There's televisions all behind me. There's speakers. And we have a ton of gear to make it just like CNN does. And we'll probably in the future even make live streams on a much more fanciful level because we could go in the field live now with all the gear that we have because it's, it's amazing. We literally have the same kind of production power as like these mainstream media outlets without having to have their massive overhead by owning like gigantic skyscrapers and buildings and having reporters and journalists. And instead of having just a journalist whose sole job is to report, we have guys that actually are knowledgeable, very knowledgeable about what they're doing. So business guys like myself talking about business, guys who are really good at picking up girls that are talking about picking up girls, guys who are good at health and fitness talking about health and fitness, and guys who are famous self-improvement gurus who have really massively changed their lives and helped make that transformation to others talking about that and then interviewing those people in each of these different fields. And that's kind of like the new goal of what we're going to be expanding to in Real Social Dynamics. Now, of course, dating and pickup and self-actualization and change from that process, that identity level change process from the learning of pickup has always been our core focus. It still is going to be. But as these new branches build, I'm gonna be definitely instrumental in that. And with the vision of having a guy who has a very strong mission, having Tyler as our chairman of the board of our company, it's really cool to have a future vision, several years in the future of having this company as a really massive company. I'd love to have you guys get the behind the scenes scoop of how we do this just sharing with you guys because it's gonna be a really epic experience. I love the idea of being able to watch behind the scenes shows because I watched Jay-Z creating a black album from behind the scenes as a documentary and I said, you know what, it'd be really awesome if we could do that in RSD. And that's what I'm kind of trying to do with our YouTube channel here, or my YouTube channel here at youtube.com forward slash Nick official. But at the same time, it's kind of fun to be a part of that whole process. And you'll see a lot more of us coming into the mainstream as what the mainstream is gonna be because I believe that a lot of the mainstream in terms of just reaching a mass amount of audience is gonna come from influencers. Influencers like myself and all, all the other RSC instructors. Anyway, if you guys haven't noticed, today is Thursday and on Thursday I released a mastermind interview. I released a great one with RSC Madison. There's gonna be awesome interviews I've already prepared. I have a backlog of several months of edited videos that are about to be queued up into my channel every Thursday. I'll be creating a lot more and as I create that backlog of stuff already loaded and scheduled to be released on certain days on my channel, I'll probably create more shows. Right now I have two shows, the mastermind interviews, which are awesome interviews with amazing people. 
that are from my mastermind group, very successful people in the business world and also in their personal lives and networking, et cetera. And then the Ask Nick Coach, where we could ask me questions directly, kind of like how I pummel through a ton of questions here, but I like going deeper and longer and just try to pummel through the questions on a very profound, more impactful way. And I'll do it in different environments while I travel around and try to make, make some fun out of it, make it inspiring. Now, if you go through RSD Founders Club, of course, I go through a lot of these concepts too. I talk very, very deeply about my belief systems and how I was able to get success and from the people that I've noticed get massive success in their business life, what they're doing right and what I've done personally because although I like modeling people that are really successful, I like just doing things on my own way and I have very extreme views, very different than a lot of other people. And unlike a lot of people that are teaching business, I'm coming from the standpoint of somebody who has taught a lot in terms of pickup and for those skills and core approach and the practice of walking up to somebody, which is something that 99% of people don't do, for especially core approach networking. They're usually doing it through social circle, and I have a massive skill set for that as well. But I like the knowledge from those two aspects of networking and building relationships, ensuring how that applies to the business world. It's a very unique way of looking at things. And I developed one of the largest Rolodexes in the world because of these skill sets. You'll notice even from the most powerful people that I've interviewed, they'll say Nick has one of the most powerful networks in the world. And you'll hear that again and again because they've been to a lot of the networking groups. They've met a lot of people through me. And I organize at the homes of various billionaire friends of mine or in villas, in various exotic locations, events for my closest, most powerful friends or friends that have a lot to share with each other so they could learn from each other and then they could add more value for their clients. And I thought it was just a fun thing to do. I was doing that mostly as a hobby. I wasn't trying to do it for making money. I might do events like that for other people to try to like get some profit. So if I invest my time into something like this, I could do it more often because I was only doing this like once a year. Now it's even less than that. But I'd love to share with you some of the ways that I view things. So I view things in a very unique way. I have a very, very unique lifestyle because being just the founder of a company allows you to have very interesting insights. But here, you know, Tyler and I, we're really kind of co-founders and pioneers of a whole industry. And as a result, the insights that we developed are very, very, very unique. And I think that's what attracts us to people that have way more money, way more success in our present time than us. And it allows us to have a clear path and be able to hang out with all these people and get the inspiration from that and share it with you. And so I really look forward to that process because I love the idea of sharing. I have a smile on my face when I share and I'm having fun when I'm talking, what I'm talking about. And I've told people who ask me, why did I create this channel? I created this channel because for me, it was inspiring, it was fun. And I'm gonna keep doing this as long as it's fun. And also I, I feel like giving value to other people is also a lot of fun. And sharing it, not just as the business operator, because I'm a great operator. And I, I would, you know, I'm, I'm increasing my skills more and more as a teacher. I think I'm increasing my free flow state. So at first, you know, I might be you know, kind of lost for words. I try to develop that organized structure of thought processes teaching. Because I remember back in the day, like when I was on a world tour, I was just kind of like free flowing, like a free flowing like rapper where my words were just flowing like fire. Like you see guys like Tyler, they're completely like that. It's because they're always teaching. Me, I might be like on, like on a phone call, I might be doing text messages and I just have to get my mind free. But having that freeness, it feels awesome. So I love that feeling internally. I love sharing with you guys. Please add comments, please share and um, get your friends to subscribe to my channel. And if you're not already subscribed, definitely subscribe because I love uh, doing these uh, conferences. But thanks for uh, showing up today. I hope you guys had a lot of fun, learned a lot of stuff. And uh, I hope to see you guys in the comments and also my future videos or my mastermind groups at RSD World Summit. We're doing that at the end of, uh, well, I guess in like a couple weeks now, August 9th, no, August 7th to 13th here in Las Vegas. It's our largest event of the year. If you sign up for a boot camp Vegas immersion, you'll get to go to that summit for free. But it's a chance to meet members of my mastermind group. Some of the special guests we're bringing this time is Kino Body. He's a huge YouTube celebrity. Brandon Carter, another guy I interview. Bill Walsh, he's a business coach for RSD executives. And he has a huge organization called the Rainmakers. Plus, the top RSD instructors you see on our YouTube channels. I myself will be there. I haven't spoken at Summit for a very long time, but I will be on stage. And I look forward to uh, seeing you guys there now that I'm getting back into teaching. It's gonna be also at the best and coolest office that we've ever had, which is the Sapphire Strip Club. It sounds kind of funny that we'd be in the strip club, but we have like a 400 person conference room in there as a main stage. We have a 60 person training facility for Vegas Immersion. And we also have our offices with class A office space where we have our guys working in cubicles, editing video footage and what have you. But I'm gonna cut this off now. It was awesome spending some time with you. I'll catch you guys later.